Our first presenter of the day is uh, Dr. Pierre Giovinazzo from the University of Laval uh, in Quebec City. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Pierre. Um, just give a, a brief introduction to Pierre. Uh, Dr. Giovinazzo received his PhD in veterinary sciences at the University of Montreal, uh, specializing in Varroa IPM strategies. He's now a professor at the University of Laval's biology department and holds uh, a newly instituted chair in educational leadership in apiculture science. His recent research focuses on honeybee breeding, queen production, uh, pollination services, honeybee nutrition, and varroa IPM strategies. He's published over 90 scientific research publications and reports, uh, and his communication skills are recognized not only in academia, but throughout the beekeeping community at large. He was vice president of the Canadian Association of Professional Apiculturists from 2014 to 2017, and is also a member of various national and international beekeeping stakeholder associations. Pierre was instrumental in chairing a team that successful, successfully won the bid to host the Apimondia Congress here in Canada in 2019 and was president of the 46th Apimondia Congress in Montreal. Uh, also just last month, Pierre was, was also recognized by the Canadian Honey Council uh, when he was awarded the Willie Baumgartner Memorial Award for his outstanding contributions to improving the Canadian beekeeping industry. Uh, so we're very lucky to have with us today, Dr. Pierre Giovinazzo. And uh, Pierre, you can take it away whenever you're ready. I think you should have screen Thank sharing you. capabilities. Thank you. So what, what are you seeing? The right one or the warm one? <laughs> We're seeing the presenter view. Okay. Probably the wrong one. This is the best one? Yeah, that's good now. Okay. Well, uh, th thank you for very much for inviting me over. So um, it's just probably next time we'll be in person, I hope. <laughs> um, so um, I'm gonna go through a talk. I think um, I have 30 minutes, so I'll, it'll, you know, I'll, it's a potpourri talk with a lot of stuff in it. Uh, but the title, as uh, was mentioned by Daryl, is the strenuous road towards Canadian honey bee stock self sufficiency. Um, so let's just start. Okay. So just to show you a, a couple of uh, the first slide is just to show you what I do when I have my lunch break here at the university. I go through a lot of old stuff. I have a really nice collection of old publications, and uh, this is a this one is from 1923, and it sort of introduces well the talk that I have today with you guys. Um, bees and how to keep them. So that was in 1923 and it's still the same thing 100 years later. So it's just curious to see that, uh, that, that we're still trying to keep our bees and, uh, and we're still stuck with a lot of imports of bees and queens uh, since, even though we still do wintering. So uh, on this figure, you can see that wintering was done indoors, outdoors, a hundred years back, uh, maybe the things changed for sure. Like for example, um, working on the, we have no swingers and everything. It's not by foot now. So that's probably the difference that we have now. Um, I'll get a pointer here. Okay. So um, as you can see, queens are, I think queens are a national necessity for, for agriculture uh, on, on, a, on a global picture. We need a lot of queens. Uh, for example, uh, the stats tell us that between two, uh, 2010 and 2019, there was a tremendous increase of, of, of queen imports, uh, increase in price of queens also. Uh, and this sums up to 260,000 queens a year. So this is, and when, when you know that the number of colonies in Canada is about 800,000, 700,000, 800,000, that means that we have a turnover of uh, you know, about a third of everything we have in Canada as queens go by. So, and that doesn't even count the queens that we produce inside our country. So this is quite um, uh, important uh, as, a, uh, as a knowledge point. And last year and the year before, I remember talking to a lot of beekeepers that when the COVID came up and we just realized that we couldn't have planes fly in, 
that was really a really wicked wake up call for all our industry. Uh, and it's still, you know, something that we we're still scared of. And, uh, and it, that's all a part of all the other problems we have. So, which is Vero and everything. So, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible how we have so many problems and this industry still keeps standing up, you know? So, um, that's it. So that's a, sort of like the intro on this. Um, we have a lot, we have breeding going on in North America. I won't name all of these. You know, probably most of them. I'm going to principally talk about this one here, the one we have in, in Quebec. This is what you asked me to talk about. So I'll be talking about what we're doing on, on our breeding program. Uh, so, um, yeah. So why do we, why breed? bees in Canada and why to try to promote this? Well, the first, well, I, like I told you before, the, because of all that imports that are keeping us there, that we, it's, it's the dangerous of having these imports, depending on these imports is, is always something that is very risky. And other, other risks that are associated with imports are the, um, the, the pathogens that we can import. Right. For example, uh, we, we can import different kinds, different kind of uh, of uh, undesired genotypes. For example, the Africanized uh, genotype that could, that could be imported into Canada. So these are all things that could happen. And there was a uh, assessment report by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that identified the major risks that are associated with imports. And there are some that are moderate and the two moderate ones, and there are some that are low to moderate and uh, they have been identif identified as the import of genes that we don't want, the Africanized bees and the import of American fall broom that could be resistant to the, one of the antibiotics that we use, Oxytet, the small high beetle, you know, and varroa resistant to our treatments here. And the treatment that we're, we're seeing the resistance appearing since the past two years is a resistance to amitraz. So we have to give more of this product to have uh, the same efficacy that, it had, that, it, that we had maybe five or six years back. So this is uh, problems that, that were identified by our Canadian Food in Inspection Agency and that limit the imports into Canada. So with this in mind, uh, I've been working on a um, research program at University Laval uh, with the CRESAD. And the goal of this when I started was always to increase self-sufficiency to the Canadian beekeeping industry through five items, selection, control of pathogens, management practices, for example, how to do nukes during the summer, or how to winter, better wintering, nutrition, and health diagnostics. So these are the four, five points. I'll be going through most of these, and I will be passing a little more time on uh, management practices, uh, because I think you want to learn, want to know what we've been doing on queen banking, and I'll be talking about the selection program mainly. So this is where I work in Quebec. Uh, uh, it's right over here, Quebec City, if you know where it is. So right on the, on the St. Lawrence Seaway. And my research station is about 60 kilometers off of that, where we have a research farm uh, with all farm animals there. And my uh, beekeeping uh, yard is, beekeeping, my beekeeping um, building is there. And we manage, uh, for example, this winter, we wintered 375 colonies that are exclusively used for research. So we have uh, apiaries uh, around 50 kilometers around our around this farm uh, and we manage uh, to manage these colonies for all our various research projects. So it's a really nice place. I hope we'll be able to have a meeting there once uh, in the future. Um, so I start with one of the projects that we're doing uh, and I think it's really cool. It's a it's a Trans-Canada, a trans-Canadian project with uh, Rob is there, Steve Pernal, uh, Leonard uh, uh, fr uh, from Vancouver, and it's um, uh, Amro that is lead on this, Amro Zaid and Leonard Foster. So, uh, uh, so it's really neat to see that we all, even though we have a, a very tremendous big country, 
we still work together. So this, I think, is very neat. Uh, and it's very profitable for the industry, for our industry, because we, we're, we have, we're, we're doing very nice work on this project, which is BCSI. And we're trying to identify markers associated with Canadian beekeeping management practices, uh, for example, pollination, different pollination strategies, and with a different kind of stressor, pesticides, uh, and various pathogens. So it's ongoing. Uh, and we have we, we've been working for two years, uh, unfortunately during the pandemic, but uh, we've managed to do a lot of work during that time anyway. Uh, other work that I've been doing in, at, at the, at, in my lab here is um, viral control. So still interested in that. So we've worked on VSH, SMR uh, breeding. And uh, one of my latest projects now is on the oxalic acid pads that are uh, impregnated in glycerin. So this is one of my masters is finishing on this. And we, um, we're working on this tr to try to promote summer treatments. Um, and I'll be explaining why I'm going on that strategy now is that I, we've been finding that treating in fall is not, it's, it's too late. <laughs> so it's, we have to treat before. So I'll, I'll show you why in a couple of minutes. Um, done a lot of work on nutrition. And I, I'm telling you that now in the next years, we'll be probably uh, um, have a commercial probiotic uh, nutrition, nutrition for bees uh, with a company we're working. Uh, so we have a lot of papers published on this. And the latest one that was published just last week is shows that one of the probiotics, well, one of the bacteria that, that we isolated from the a honeybee gut um, me, uh, metabolizes uh, a pesticide. So this is really neat. So, uh, so this is the title, indigenous honeybee gut microbiome metabolize a clothianidin, which is a uh, derivative, derivative of imidacloprid. So we did a lot of work on this on nazima and uh, honeybee nutrition, wintering and the whole thing. So we're getting there. It's been now seven years. Uh, we're working on these different probiotics and um, another project that is now finished. And again, it was Trans Canada project, still the same gang that, that are not on BCSI. Well, um, again, uh, on this, we have um, been working on uh, omic tools to help breeding programs. And we just have a paper that was published about a month ago uh, in Plus One. And Renata uh, was mainly the, the one that wrote this, but uh, it's really neat paper. So if you have time to, uh, if you have, if you want to read it and see what the results of this, it's already published. So it's available online. Uh, now I'm gonna to talk to you about our breeding program. So this is work that Segalen has been doing on her PhD here with me at Laval. And we published two papers on this, on the gen genetic parameters that we uh, follow and um, we also recently published a paper on the progress we've been having for the past 10 years. So this is what I'm going to show you now. So uh, it started in 2009 where I imported some honeybees from Denmark. And I had, uh, these are the, the, the Buckfast bees. So we imported Buckfast lines from Denmark and we mixed them with uh, Quebec lines that we have from Anisette uh, and uh, other beekeeper in Quebec. Um, and we started here in 2010 with a hundred and some colonies. And each year, our data bank, so our pedigree data, accumulates data each year. So at this time now, in 2019, we have over uh, 2,000 data sets. That means we can follow our, our, our queens right back to the grand, grand, grandmothers uh, way back in 2010. So we have all this pedigree data and this pedigree data is very, very important because it gives us the performances of the ancestry of our colonies. So this is really neat now. So we're continuing on this. So each year we have approximately 150 colonies that are exclusively used for our breeding program since 2010. Um, so what do we do? So what we do is we do phenotypic evaluations. That means uh, we measure honey, for example, all sorts of measurements of performance of the colonies. And what we want to do is when we select 
we want to exclude everything that is from the environment so that the only thing that we measure is the genes, the genes that are performing. And we want to eliminate also all the interactions between these different parameters so that we have an addition when we do our selection, we add the best genetics year after year. So uh, we have been using for the past four years a, mo a statistical model that is called the Bluff Animal Model. Uh, it's an adaptish, uh, it's adapted from a model that is used in the cows and pigs. Uh, and we are helped by these uh, statistics, statisticians from, from this industry in Quebec. But we adapt, this is adapted from the German model that has been using it for the bees for many years now. So we have a similar model now for bees uh, uh, and it is adapted from the German and the, the blood model that we have here in Quebec. So this is how we use the whole thing. And we, we have been using what we call the genetic value of our queens genetic values of our breeding lines, for example, and giving a, also a breeding value. So these are the parameters that we follow, the criteria that we follow. For health, we do, as you know, uh, the free skill group test for the hygienic behavior. We do varroa counts. We, met, we weigh our colonies for honey production. And since the past four years, we are now weighing the supers. So we're not weighing the whole hives. We've been doing that for many years, but we've given a more uh, added precis precision and we really weigh the honey now, only the honey. And we do, uh, we measure how much um, sugar syrup is consumed during the winter by the colonies. And we, uh, one important part of this is, uh, as you know, in Quebec, we have got blueberries that are very important, cranberries, apples and everything. So. Uh, beekeepers have to have colonies ready for blueberries that is in, in, uh, in early June. So we select for colonies that develop very fast. So, uh, this, is, so this is what I, we call spring development. So what we were able to do with our pedigree data it, are, is really neat, you know, really neat stuff for the industry. So it's bringing the industry a step forward toward the modern way of doing things in breeding. Uh, so we were able to calculate the heritability of our different criterias. And uh, for example, uh, when we, we have, uh, I have three of these criteria here, spring development, honey production in hygienic behavior. Uh, and the values here, H square is the, the heritability. This is important because if a criteria is not heritable, that means it's useless in, in selection. So some criterias or some performances are more heritable, heritability than others. And this is the case here. So spring development is nearly twice more heritable than the hygienic behavior. So that means you have to select strongly for hygienic behavior for it to advance year after year. But in the, on the other way, when spring development will go quicker. So you'll increase your spring development uh, when you select for that criteria. So that gives you an idea. So this is how we prepare our strategy. So each spring, and now we're going to have our meeting uh, in the following weeks with Andre Segalen. We're going to sit down and we're going to decide what we're going to do. Okay. So for example, uh, in since 2018, we've been always selecting more for hygienic behavior because it's less heritable and putting less importance on honey production and spring de development because they are more heritable. So uh, we, uh, when we decide of our breeding value and we calculate our breeding value, we give it a proportion. And then uh, where health is more important than the other ones, but the other ones are, are easily uh, her 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 heritable by the by the descendants, so this levels out. So this is how we decide. Uh, this year, we're going to decide also probably something that will be similar like this. So that means all our criteria will advance at the same time towards where we want them to go. So this is the genetic progress that we've had since 2010. So it's a 
slow process and you have to understand this is genetic progress so this is the genes that are changing so this is very important so we've showed genetic progress for uh, spring development honey production and hygienic behavior so for example uh, for things that we know better uh, we've been we've have had we've had measured a 0.6 kilograms increase per year of genetic progress in our program so our, our the, so this is very very interesting okay the other thing that we've been working on and it's really neat is um, queens uh, as you know i've been working on that for many years now and uh, we've just published a paper last year on our storage of mass storage of queens so this i'll take a little bit time to talk to you about this i have um, uh, two master's students working on this. So Mireille has just finished her master's and Maggie, she's doing, he's, she will finish uh, later on this year. So uh, I'll be show you how we're doing this. So to, just to introduce this whole thing, I want to return to stuff I've done in, two, in 2008, 2007, where we measured the queen quality that were, um, we had in Quebec. And in red here, we have on this graph here, you have the sperm count in the spermateca, the sperm count on the spermateca and the sampling dates. And um, here we have May. And this one here is imports. And these are the California queens. Uh, so this is in millions of sperm. And so normally when you have about 6 million, 5 million sperm in the spermateca, that's okay. And you know? also that's a, a good quality queen. But what I want to show you is these here. So these queens over here, the queens that we have in um, late August, have very high, are very well mated. <laughs> and that's understandable because we have a lot of drones out there. And unfortunately, at that time when we did this, when I, we showed this, this information to the beekeepers, um, you know, the, we don't use queens. We don't requeen. Usually we don't requeen at the end of August because it's too late. We want the queens earlier. Uh, and usually the queens that our queen producers were doing at this time, they were just stuck with them. Nobody wanted them. So um, with this in mind, we, 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 which is still the case, we have a lot of queens at the end of August that are available. So we just said, why don't we just bank them, you know, and see if we can keep them for the next, uh, for the next year. So this started the whole thing. The other thing I want to talk to you about is winter bees. Um, so this is a nice uh, work by Anton in, in Switzerland where you see here different colors of bees. So he just took his hives, colored the, the, the emergent bees uh, at different times at the end of August, right up to October, November. And he wanted to see how long these bees live, okay? And as you can see here, uh, the, the, the bees that were marked in August, early August, they die usually after 40 days like any other bee. But once you get to these bees that that, uh, that emerge later on in September, these are the bees that live longer. These are the winter bees. And this is something probably most of you know because this comes from Manitoba work from, from Lloyd Harris, which is really nice work here. Uh, and a nice picture also that you really understand what goes on. So these are the bees in blue here. You have adult worker bees, age here. And below here, you have the brood. And this is in August. Uh, so on the 31st of August, all these bees that are here, if you follow them, all these blue bees, they sort of die off later on, okay? Die off towards October. But these here, these are the, this is the brood that emerges, and this brood lives long once they emerge. So these are the bees that live long, okay? So brood that emerges at the in September make up the bees that cluster the whole winter. So I, I know all of you know this, but just remember how important it is to control the varroa at this time. This is when the varroa uh, the varroa population are at their highest. And this is where they usually all go into the brood at that time. And remember that brood is so important because those are the bees that will winter, okay? So you have to treat. And you have to treat, I think, earlier than this time because, you know, it, it, they're already in the brood, okay? 
So uh, this is why we're working on on treating earlier in summer now. Uh, and remember, once this brood emerges, all of these varroa are all around in, in, on the winter bees now. So, uh, so then you can treat with oxalic acid right over here. So this is where oxalic acid is at its best, is when there's no brood. All the varroa mites are outdoors, are out on, uh, on the bees. So then oxalic acid works at its best right around here. So we've been doing oxalic acid in, in, uh, for, in Quebec, a lot of people, most of the people do it in November uh, with the dripping method. Okay. The other thing is the cluster. So uh, as you know, our bees cluster in the, in, in, during the winter when temperatures go down and the center of that cluster keeps nice and warm and our queen is in there. So I'm introducing you this because when we wanna bank our queens inside a cluster like this, so we have to, the, 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 there's a problem there because if it gets too cold, the cluster will get compact and the, the queens that are outside of this will die. So, you know, the, the bees will try to keep the, the center warm, but if it's too cold, they'll leave everything out there. So that was one of the problems we had when preparing our, our protocol for our queen banking. So this is how we did our queen banking. So there was some research on this, uh, past research on this, uh, where success was variable. Um, so what we do is we prepare our queens on a frame. So we modify a frame. We put 40 queens on there, uh, 20 on each side, uh, quite central. And we put this in a queen, in a queenless colony. Uh, and this is the really important part is, and we're, this is what we're working on now in the next years, is we're working on these bees, these winter bees. These are the ones that are important, uh, as you know. So we are, we have to treat them early. So we have to prepare these queen banks. We can't just do them in September. You have to start this in July. <laughs> you have to, so these queen, the, these, so the workers are more important than the queens. I can tell you this. So we have to um, make really strong colonies with a lot of young bees that had no varro on them. So that are in top shape, really good winter bees. Then we can introduce the frame that has the queen bank and you put it in there for the whole winter, okay? So uh, we tested different, uh, we did uh, with our method here, we did uh, 40 queens per bank. We did 15 banks and we did three, three temperatures. We tested six, 10 and the one the 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 one we 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 tried was 15 and Andre and me when we decided to do this we said oh, they'll never survive you know wintering bees at 15 for the whole winter we think we thought they would all die off you know uh, but that didn't happen uh, so the uh, this is something that really surprised me a lot that the the we kept colonies these uh, these queen banks with bees at 15 degrees, right until April, May, and we still had bees alive in June. That means the bees, they lived over 220 days. So it's really incredible. So um, this is the three temperatures and we had a control group. So just to show you, so uh, these, uh, this is what it looks like when we have them in there, when we put the bees. So they all attracted to the queens, as you know. We dissected the spermateca to check the viability of the sperm, the number of sperm, everything. So we did, uh, this is the data. And then in April, the, the queens that survived, we introduced them into new colonies to see if they were okay. So, uh, and we uh, tested them for June, July performances right up until August. So um, this is the temperature from uh, September 3rd to November 9th. So as you can see, outdoor is, is below here. So it was, it was um, in September, normal temperatures and going down right up until, uh, until November, where we took our banks and we brought them indoors, okay? At these three different temperatures. So these are our three banks at six degrees. Whoops, sorry. Uh, six degrees, 11 and 16. And as you can see at 11 and 16 degrees, our colonies, our data, our, our, our colonies stay pretty close to 27, 30 degrees. 
So our queens are kept at that temperature in there, but the banks that were kept in the wintering room, well, they were colder, okay? So the banks were colder. So this is the survival of our bank queens. So on November 9th, we had 170, 172, 168 uh, queens and uh, total queens. So at six, 11 and 16 degrees. These are controlled colonies. Controlled colonies are ordinary colonies with a queen inside of them, okay? Uh, and on the 9th of November, and on the 16th of April, in our banks, we had, in the 16 degree banks, we had a survival of 86% of queens. So I just want to say that even in the, in the banks that were at 11 and 6 degrees, we had half of them that, that survived. But this, they're still worth a lot of money, these queens. Even if we lose half of them, it's not that difficult to keep during the winter. And these queens, when, they're, when you have them in spring, they're uh, very valuable, you know, uh, because they're there in April. And, and if there are any queen breeders among us today, well, you can use those queens to start your mating nukes, you know, to, it, it's really neat. You know, it's really, really valuable queens to have these at that time. So uh, even if they, if they wouldn't survive, they would be, still be very valuable. Um, but they did survive very long. We still have queens from 2019, so that were banged. Um, so this is the, 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 the physiology information on these queens. Um, so just to show you um, the sperm viability, and I'll probably just show you this one here. Uh, so 80% viability in all our banks. That means it doesn't affect the sperm. If it's 6, 10, 16, the sperm survive, okay, in the spermateca. So it, 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 they still survive. Okay, uh, but the one difference is the queen, okay? And this is something important because in our controls, the queens, once they come up in April, they're fat, they're still big. These are the, the queens that are in, in one colony, one queen per colony. So she, the, the, she probably already started laying and everything, but our queens that are in the queen banks, they, they, they didn't start laying. So there was a regression of the, ovar of the ovaries, and this takes about two weeks, uh, and I'll show you this on the next slide. It takes about two weeks for these bank queens to start laying. So they, they won't lay right away, but they'll, it takes them a little bit time to start again. Okay. So um, this is the bank queens summer performance. So the bank queens at, uh, at 10, 15 degrees, uh, number of queens introduced in nukes. So we introduced uh, about 15 to 20 queens from each bank. Um, and, and the number of laying queens after seven days. So as you can see, most of them had started laying after seven days. And in August, uh, over 60% uh, of them were still functioning well. So uh, with at least 75% of the brood that was there. So that's the, that's the, this is published and we're going to, we'll have another paper coming out soon where Mireille worked on density. So we tried 80 queens per bank versus 40. And we went a little further with the, the, the some, some other properties of the, the queen. So this will be coming out soon. Um, Daryl, do I have some more time? Uh, you could probably have, I don't know, Ian, probably five minutes or so. Not sure what time Pierre actually started. Okay, go so, ahead, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, I want to talk about drones um, because this is important, very important when you do breeding. We have two papers on drone fertility. Uh, working on, we've been working on this. So I'll go quick on this, and I just want to go from um, something that that was adapted from the book Connors that mean bee sexuality, which is really neat, and just goes to show you how why it's difficult for us to do. To, to bring Canadian queens early in spring. Um, and this gives more importance to our banking. So, you know, we, 
And when we bank queens in September and they successfully come out in April, we have queens, Canadian queens from our breeding programs selected for our Canadian beekeeping. Okay, so we have queens. But if we don't do that, we have to import queens or wait until the queens from Canada start to be produced. And it takes time. It takes time mainly because it takes time to have the males out there. So, you know, even uh, if you take your colonies out in April, uh, they will start to produce drones, drone brood. So this is what the, the, this table shows. And, uh, but drones will take at least 15 to 20 days after emergence to be able to, uh, to be fertile. So you can't have any drones fertile before the end of May or mid-May. It's, it's, it's practically impossible. So that means you can't have good queens before that time. And that, ex that shows you why our, our queens uh, and Canadian queens are better towards June, July, August, because that's when we have a lot of drones out there, okay? So this goes to show you that uh, also that um, one, it takes more than one drone. So uh, for example, in this, in, this, uh, in this table here, it shows you how many drones you can, you can, how many drones you need to produce queens. You need a lot of drones. So, uh, so this shows that you, with, a, with only one colony of drone production, you will only produce 18 queens because that's what the, if, if all the drones are there. So you, if you want to produce 2,000 queens a week, well, you need it, at least 20 times more drones. So these, the breeders, they know this and they know they have to force production of drones. You, you, you do not have any choice. You cannot only rely on what's out there. It's, it's, it, first of all, you don't control them if you do that, and you, you're, you're risking your, 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 uh, your mating. So you have to force produce your drones. Um, this is something we wrote on, um, that was published in Bee Culture, where we found our DCA, our drone congregation area. And if I have time, I just really need to show you. Uh, this is Emil that is, taking, that is retiring, unfortunately, this year. I've been working with Emil since 1992. So we're, I guess we're all getting old over here. Uh, and uh, Emil is really instrumental for, for all the work I've been doing in, at the Cresat. And here he helped us do these drone traps. So just to show you what we've done. So we produce a lot of these young virgin queens. And this is one of our students that was placing these virgin queens in the trap. That's me with these helium balloons. And this is O that was working on there and we just, walked all over our yards, trying to find this drone congregation area. And old, uh, it, she was stressed because it was, she was walking for three weeks and she hadn't found something. But once she found it, it was really neat. So uh, we found our drone congregation area. And uh, as you can see here in the trap, the drones just whoosh, whoosh, flew in there. Uh, so this, we, and once we saw this, it's, it's spectacular seeing these comets at in midday, where you have they just fly about it's about twenty miles an hour, just go whoosh, they fly right past you. So um, we had a lot of fun with this. So this is a little video showing you all these drones going in the going in there, uh, showing you that they are all all around there. So uh, this is where we force our drone production, uh, and we force them from colonies that we know the mothers and the cousins and the grandmothers and everything. So this is very important. So we force drones of known genetics, okay? And we were walking all over and the, the congregation area was just 500 meters <laughs> beside the yard. So they were all over here. So this is what research showed us. It, sometimes it's not what we think, you know? Um, so I'm finishing with this now. So just to show you that we're, we're, we're really pushing our, our breeding program here in Quebec. Uh, we're ha we have a lot of support from our provincial government now. Um, and, and we're going to uh, launch our, our breeding strategy this year. Uh, we were supposed to launch it two years back, but with the pandemic, everything just sh shot to hell there. But now we're pushing it, it's starting off. So uh, we have a breeding program that is that people would, will be able to participate. So at University of Laval and Cresad, 
we will be doing the the breeding selection, the breeding values, uh, and doing all the all the, finit, the genotypic selection with the BLUP model, and then we're going to transfer this uh, these genetic lines to our breeders. So we have uh, different breeders that are participating uh, with us since the beginning, but we're having more and more demand for this. And, uh, and then these breeders are sending them to the, to the commercial beekeepers. So this is how we're pr promoting our, our stuff. And now I'm showing you these return arrows to, sh to tell you that we're working with a company that, is, that probably you know is Nectar. So this is um, artificial intelligence. These are bee uh, beacons that we place in the colonies. And these beacons will give me information of the performance of the colonies in the field. So we're going to do uh, breeding in at the Cressad University Laval, but we'll have information in the in the beekeeper yards. So this is really neat. So this is starting now. This is a NSERC grant for three years. We have now. We're starting this summer, and uh, so really have a lot of interest in that and the near future. So the whole thing is, you know. You have to understand that I hope I showed you that when we when you breed queens, when you do breeding, it's just it's not just multiplying colonies. It's more than that. So it, it's keeping a pedigree data set, using stats, measuring the performances correctly, and eliminating all the bias that can be in there. Us in our data, we even have uh, have the name of each person that does the measures so that we can eliminate that bias. So, so B yards, everything is taken into account in our stat in our in our statistical model. It's a lot of work. Uh, a breeder colony is worth a lot of money because we have all its background for the 10 past years. And we've been doing hygienic tests with the whole team going into yards. It's a lot of work. So the, the, the question is, who should pay for this? So I know here that there's a lot of interest now. So because of the, the you know, the, the wake-up call we've had that we're so dependent on expo imports, that's incredible. Imagine if we can't import honeybees anymore. I don't know what's going to what happen. Uh, and now we're having, I, I guess a lot of you know that we're having, a lot of people are scared of what's going to come out in spring. Here in Quebec, we have, it's a little scary. Uh, uh, we don't, we have really um, uh, dark thoughts about what's happening this, that we're scared of what's gonna come out uh, this spring. Uh, but, you know, we have to keep on working. So I think the, on this, we should have a, a queen price that is adjusted to help breeding. Uh, I think governments have to help support this because bees are so important for pollination. Uh, and for for the for the industry to keep beekeepers uh, uh, lively, you know, so that that, it, that we have young beekeepers coming in all the time. So this is very important. So we're do I just show you that we do inseminations. Two of our lines per year are inseminated. So so that's it. So um, I hope it's um, it, it's okay, uh, Daryl. Uh, so I, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Pierre. That was, that was really great. Um, I think in the interest of time, we might just keep it to maybe two questions. Uh, I see that Ian does have a question. He has his hand raised. Go ahead, Ian. Not certainly a question, but we're getting uh, requests to, if you would allow us to provide this on our uh, MBA uh, YouTube page, other members would like to show other members. Do we have your permission with that, Pierre? Yes, you, you do. Everything is, uh, is okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, one other question here in the chat, Pierre. How do you keep queen banks at 15 degrees Celsius? And can you describe that method? Yeah, okay. You, uh, we, we built a room. And we have beekeepers in Quebec that have built rooms now. That have built like little garages, you know, that are, and uh, uh, even qu some queen breeders have started these little rooms. Yeah. So uh, rooms that are kept at, um, 16 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Do you think that's something that beekeepers here could, could try out or? Oh, uh, uh, 
I, we're, we're doing it. <laughs> uh, I'd say if you if you um, um, if you have if you want to invest in that, I'd say maybe have a little bit research on this first on your side, test it uh, on a small scale for starters, and you will rapidly see that it is extremely important how you prepare the banks. This is the tricky part. And uh, we still have to work on this because I want to work on the, these winter, the winter bees that are that are in that help that are uh, that are forming the banks are extremely extremely important, uh, and they have to be as uh, low pathogen loads as possible, which is quite a challenge. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe one last question. There is uh, a comment in chat here. I heard from a Quebec beekeeper about studies on cuticle damage from oxalic acid. Uh, can you comment on that study at all? Uh, I haven't seen that study. Uh, uh, it um, uh, I'd have to see it, but I know we've been doing oxalic acid, Jesus, for at our research station, at least, I can say that we've been doing oxalic acid uh, each year in, uh, in, uh, on beginning November 11th uh, by the dripping method, five grams, you know, the, the standard method. We've been doing this for the past 15 years. And we have, uh, with a, a good varroa treatment in right at the start of September, uh, usually we use uh, thymobar or um, ap apivar, and we have an average of between 9 and 11 percent mortality on our 300 to 400 colonies we have at the Cressa, at, our, at my research station. And uh, our beekeeper, uh, I haven't heard, uh, I've heard rumors that some that do double and triple oxalic acid have seen some impact on brewed during the on the spring brew production but i haven't noticed this uh, at our research station uh i'll just ask this last question very quickly maybe just give a quick answer was any additional supplemental feeding needed for the the queen banks kept at 16 degrees nice yeah yes there we have to feed them we have to we have to feed them all, all winter uh and feed them sugar syrup uh, and a nice and a clear, a very you know, a pure sec, a sucrose uh, and, and no honey, you know. But they 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 are. Uh, but we don't have to feed them very much. Uh, we feed them more towards the end there, towards uh, March sometimes. But they have a lot of food feed in there, and this is that that was one curiosity, and we still have to work on this because is that you know they don't seem to consume more than than. Then at this, at this, when they keep them in, indoors there, at the six degree in the wintering room, uh, it's, it's just weird, you know, they just, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, it was great to have you join us uh, this afternoon. It was um, a pleasure. Okay. Appreciate your time with us.